and away we go. Hey, man, I know you're on the road right now down in Naples, Florida. Uh, I, you know, and you're there for like four nights in a row. So I imagine you're probably doing the same club, right? Yeah, we're down in, uh, we got here last night and uh night before we were doing, uh, God, we're, we were in Tampa and now we're in Naples, Florida. And we're at this really cool club called off the hook. Nice. Yeah, with Jim Brewer, stuff. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been, uh, I'm out on the road with Jim and, uh, it's been great, you know, featuring for him. It's just, it's the best it's shows are killer. It's a great hang. You know, we get to do great clubs. He packs them out. So it's, it's, for me, it's it's the best spot you can imagine. You know, you're just in the sweet spot. You get to just do you know shows in front of stacks of people, and it's super super fun. Cool. I want to get. I want to talk to you about your comedy career that you started. Uh, but first, I wanted to go back a ways a little bit here. We're going where, back. Where, whereabouts in California are you? Because I'm not sure if you're from San Jose or you're from Southern California. Where in California did you grow up? I grew up in San Jose. I grew up in San Jose. Uh, my mother and father moved to Santa Cruz originally. And then San Jose is about, I don't know, say 30 minutes away from Santa Cruz. So I grew up in Santa Cruz. My mom and dad split up when I was about 10. And my dad moved to San Jose. And my mom stayed in Santa Cruz <clears throat> all the way up until she passed away last January. And she, so she, she remained there. And then my dad uh, stayed in stayed in San Jose, the Bay area up until about four years ago, he came down to San Diego. Uh, but I ended up moving from San Jose to Los Angeles right around uh, 89, 90 and remain there until now. I'm in Oceanside, California now. Oh yeah. Oceanside. Yeah. So that's, uh, isn't that down there, San Diego? Yeah. Right near San yeah. Diego. So, <clears throat> so it was a trip right before the pandemic moved down to uh, or right during the pandemic got out of LA because it was just too just nothing was happening so decided to you know wait the pandemic out in San Diego fell in love with it and I was living in little Italy at that point and then about a year ago decided to uh, check out Oceanside I surf up there a lot so it was it just kind of worked out found a place up there and now I love Oceanside. It's killer. That's awesome, dude. I lived in LA for like yeah. 14 years. So oh, really? I used to go down to San Diego a lot. And I love San yeah, Diego. San Diego's too. Kinda, yeah, San Diego's the getaway from LA for sure. At first, it was just a stop going to Tijuana, <laughs> but then I started <laughs> going there more often, you know, uh, once I got to know the area. Um, when you were growing up in Northern California, what, what was that like? And when did you start listening to music? And what kind of music were you listening to? I mean, for me, growing up in Northern California, um, you know, as a little kid, I lived I lived out in the middle of nowhere. We lived in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, growing up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, we were on five acres of land. My parents uh, had this idea to have like a horse ranch. So they had a horse ranch out there. Oh, wow. They, yeah. Like my dad was still teaching at that point. So the idea was they were going to kind of, you know, they, they were they were definitely – people that wanted to have, they wanted to get off the grid a bit. You know, they, my dad worked and my mom ran this horse ranch with them. And then on the weekends they did that together. And, you know, as far as music went, it was the Sebs. So like in the seventies, it was everything from what my parents grew up on, Jerry Vale, Frank Sinatra, all of that. But then, you know, a lot of music like Elton John, the Eagles and, um, you know, uh, Jim Croce, all that started, kind of that that really is what i really remember being a part of growing up in the music that i would hear around the house and um we had this stereo and i always love to tell people like it was like that's kind of where i learned how to dj because my parents would have parties and when they had these parties they'd invite all these people over and you know i was kind of like in the background like all right joey time to go to bed but since I knew how to like run the stereo and I knew the music and stuff, I'd go over there and like one record would end and I'd put on another record. So I was able to stay up with the adults and I loved being around that energy of, I always loved being around the energy of, of, uh, you know, um, people and music and that kind of, I, I think that's why I love, you know, being on the road so much because it's just every night, different group of people, and that energy of the show. And and I feel like at a young age, I really got to be around the energy. It, it was almost like growing up in my living room was like growing up in a backstage because there were so many people coming and going. And I just, I really enjoyed meeting different people. And also there was always music on. There was a soundtrack on it all the time. 
when did you veer towards music that you liked <clears throat> more from what your parents, uh, what you grew up on? Man, I would, I know exactly when that happened. Basically, right around the time that I was, gosh, I was, uh, my parents got separated and my dad had me, um, it, you know, I'd come to visit him on the weekend and uh, I was really into skateboarding. I was good at sports, but sports weren't really like, like I was smaller. So like, I, I just didn't get the, I just didn't get the, you know, the, the play time on the court as much as everyone else. And I really was into skateboarding. And at a certain point, um, when I went to visit my dad, he was like, Hey, Joey, there's a skateboard park. And that skateboard park was Winchester skateboard park and Winchester skateboard park at the time was the home base for Steve Caballero and Gavin O'Brien and Corey oh, yeah. O'Brien and Bob DeNike and Rick Blackheart and, uh, Tom Nicodemo and who else? Uh, Peter Gifford, like all these heavy skateboarders. Wow. And I, you know, read about them or seen them, but then all of a sudden, you know, right around, you know, 11, 12 years old, my dad brought me to skateboard park. So I got to become a member of that park. And that really changed my life because my love of skateboarding, you know, that just was connected, but also uh, the music that, was being played at the skateboard park. It was right as Van Halen and Boston and like that music was starting to not come to an end, but that it, it was starting to shift from that to bands like 999, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, of course. Late seventies. Yeah. Late seventies. Yeah. And that music really, for me, you know, Black Flag, 999, Circle Jerks, all that just really spoke to me. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I get it now. This, this I'm really into this. So it was that was that was something that was super cool, you know. And that that definitely was a game changer because skateboarding and punk rock at that moment, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't start going to shows because I was in seventh grade. But my interest and my, I wanted to find out so much about it. So I I, I really, um, it, it, you know, at that time I, you would call it research, but research meant finding an older kid that had a brother that had right. a record player that maybe might have a black flag seven inch. So that was really um, like my pursuit at that point. Did you play an instrument at all when you were young? Um, when I was younger? No. I mean, for me, um, I started playing bass when I was in high school. A kid left a bass at my house and it, he, he left it there because his brother owed him money. So he's like, hold on to this bass. <laughs> and i'll get it when my brother pays me back but his brother ended up going to jail so i i ended up having this base and i uh i started messing around with it at night you know i'd come home and i'd be like oh cool i didn't even have a pick i used a quarter and then i had some friends kind of show me like different you know different songs and different you know ways to play and then i really got into that and i started my first band when i was about 15 and it was called rage and i was the bass player and and I was in a band with these guys and like they didn't really write a lot of songs. So, you know, I started messing around with writing songs, writing lyrics. I was I was really into it. So there was a little period of time before you started Wax from when you started playing. Oh, there... absolutely. Like the from the time. Yeah. I mean, there was a huge time because yeah. when I lived in San Jose. So I was in this band rage. And then right around the time, 1985, when I graduated from high school, I met these guys that were looking for a singer in san jose and we put together this band called frontline and that was like my first real band where like we got a tour we got to go on the road we you know we were <clears throat> we were a local band that got to play for like you know like uh in our hometown there was a place called one step beyond that was a, that was like the main club and there was another club called laundry works and if bigger bands like social distortion came through or uh you know um I would say like social distortion, the UK subs, English dogs, all of those bands that would come through on that, like kind of that wave of English punk that came through. So I'm like from like 85 to right around 89, you know, that, that band that I had together with frontline, we, 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 we toured everywhere too. We did our first tour of the United States with like, or we did, we did a tour of the uh, Texas, uh, Salt Lake city and stuff like that. And that was like a summer tour that I did. Uh, and that was with uh, this band. We opened up for Verbal Abuse. Oh, nice uh, band out of San Francisco. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of like when punk rock and metal were merging together. Right. But uh, yeah, I was in that band for a while, and then right when I got out of college, um, that band fell apart, 
And that was when I took the trip down to Southern California and stayed there from ever since. And then Wax formed soon after that. Yeah, we. I got together with Wax. So I got down there probably in like, I don't know, 90 and probably 91. I was down there by 91 for sure. And I was living there and I was living on Sunset and Fuller uh sunset boulevard and fuller in in hollywood and uh i i met a i met some people that i knew from coming down there and it was the classic thing you know just couch surfing trying to find a job trying to find a place to live trying to get your foot in there and at the same time i was trying to you know find people that you know maybe i could start a band with and i didn't really i didn't know anyone except a handful of people i knew steve soto but he lived in huntington beach and i didn't know the distance between Hollywood and Huntington Beach at that point. And I had some friends in Venice Beach. And I had one friend, my buddy Brian Turcott, who lived in um in Hollywood. And he was the guy that said, All right, you can stay on my couch for like a month, but after that, you're on your own. And you know, within that month, I figured out a place to work, found a roommate, moved in, did that thing. And at the same time, then I started pursuing, you know, like, okay, how can I how can I find someone? You know, how can I find a group of people that might be looking for a singer? And um at that point, I remember, you know, different bands coming through. I remember the Goo Goo Dolls were coming through and I was really into them. <clears throat> they had just had that record come out on Metal Blade. Yeah, I was working I at was... Metal Blade when that record came out. Actually. Yeah. 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 I love that record. Yeah. Uh, Hold Me Up. Right. Hold right. Me Up. Yeah. Oh, my God. We had a few, so... a couple. Of... Jed was also on Metal Blade, too. We had a God. few of their records. I just love that record. Hold Me Up was a game changer. And yeah. then I was really into them. I was really. And then. What was funny was they came to town to do a show at uh, English Acid on like a Monday night and I went to it. And then after that show, um, I saw uh, at Guitar Center that I, I made like a, um, I put up a thing like, you know, I was looking for a band. And back then you put up like a, you just write down your what you were looking for. And, and, they, and I put everything from like the Goo Goo Dolls to the Fluid to the Ramones to the Clash. And then I got a phone call. Uh about a week later from this dude and he was like hey man <clears throat> i know you're looking i know you're looking to uh so you're looking you're, i was looking for a drummer and he was like i drum i'm like oh cool and we started talking and he's like you know you should we should hang out so i went had some beers but it, when i went up to the, the where they lived it was they actually had a band and they were looking for a singer and they were like what do you think about singing for our band and then it was just one of those kind of things where they seem like cool dudes you know, and that was the guys in wax. That was Loomis, Dave, and Soda. They just wow. seemed like cool dudes, so we just did it. You know, while you were in uh, Sunset and Fuller, I was working at Sunset and La Brea, <laughs> right down the road from you. And uh, I went out on the road with um, Face to Face. Were you at, is that when you were at AM? Yes. And yeah, I went out yeah. on the road. I, 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 I mean, for for people that are listening, you're gonna miss this. But if you're on YouTube, I'll, I'm gonna show you a photo in a sec. I mean, if you're yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm gonna show you a photo. I went out to cover face to face shows in the Midwest, and they were with the Boston's and Wax. It was around the time that you were supporting Thirteen Unlucky L Numbers, which yeah. I think was the Interscope record, right? Yeah, that was the Interscope yeah. record <clears throat> that originally came out on Sidewalk Dummy, and then we got signed. We got signed to Interscope, but that tour with the Mighty Mighty Boston's and Face to Face, that's like, that was the, that tour was probably the best. And like, we had all toured, like I toured before, but being on tour at the Boston's was just a whole never, whole nother level. It was just packed shows and it was amazing. Oh yeah. This, this is the photo. If you're watching on YouTube, that's Joe Sib and myself, 1994 five or six or could even wow. be four. I'm not even sure it was yeah. around that time. But those shows I remember were um, they were sold out because the boss tones were really on fire at that time. And, yeah, absolutely. you know, with you guys in face to face on the bill, that was a great lineup. And I remember such that's a great where, night that's where I met you. Um, so I was a little confused about the time span here. I didn't realize Side One Dummy, the label that you're co-owner of, started before you signed to Interscope. I yeah. didn't realize it was around that long. Yeah, yeah. The first record, the first record that we put out was the Wax record. We put out all the seven inches, and and then we put out the Wax record, thirteen unlucky numbers, and then it, then Interscope 
uh, basically bought the record off of us, you know, off of side one and, and, and then they put it out, you know, obviously blew it up. But um, yeah, that record started out on side one dummy. That was like one of the first releases that we did like that swinging udders and the wax record was the first, the first record that we put out. I got my times line a little mixed well, up it's here. Like, Cause it's very, cause it, like wax went through a weird thing where, you know, we, we were signed <clears throat> to originally we were signed to Caroline, Caroline, and, right. Caroline and Virgin. And the first record came out on uh Caroline. And then when we went to make the second record, that was, you know, 13 lucky numbers. That was the second record that was initially supposed to come out in, you know, on Virgin records. We were supposed to come out on Virgin. Cause at the time Virgin was doing this thing where, Bands like Smashing Pumpkins, you'd release, they owned Caroline. So they did this thing where like, hey, you'll have an indie record on Caroline. Yeah. And then after the Caroline record, we'll put you on version. For Smashing Pumpkins, it worked out great. For us, not so much. We made the second record and version ended up dropping us. So we were in this limbo stage for about a year and a half where we didn't have a label. And that's when I started Cyber Dummy. And when, you know, that was just to put out the wax record. And then initial, and then when Swax got picked up, my partner Bill and I, uh, you know, we we were roommates, and Bill Armstrong and I, we've been best friends forever. And you know, we hung out, and you know, we were. It was like when I started side one. He's just like, we should, you know, we should, we should just keep doing this. So then that was kind of how we we kept kept it going. Around that time in the nineties, yeah, around that time in the nineties, <laughs> a lot of majors were doing that. We, we were having, I was at the indies that some of us did it. And I was at the majors when we did it. You wanted to have that indie credibility. So you would put out an independent record first. And then yeah. um, I wanted to ask you about the California, not just the single, but the video, because Spike Jones did that. And I know that was a yep. huge deal for you guys. What was it like? I mean, that video, I still see it in my head, the flaming guy <laughs> running down the street. What was that experience like for you? I mean, you know, it was, you know, how do you even, the experience was insane. You know, it being a part of it was, was amazing. I feel like, I still feel like, oh, wow, that, that was such a part of, you know, rock and roll history and, and the way it all came together. And, you know, what I really, what, you know, what was great about the whole thing was, you know, Spike, when we, when I met Spike and when the band met Spike, he was a photographer taking photos of skateboarding and BMX. And he was just, he was just one of us hanging out. And then as his career exploded and he did our very, very first video for Caroline records too, he did the hush video. So we'd already worked with him. <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, he had just, we had always talked about was, you know, as his career exploded and, and un unfortunately, you know, we got dropped. So we kind of, we were kind of, you know, in the rear view mirror at that point. But what I loved about Spike was, you know, he had already done the Weezer video. He had done all these videos. And at the same time, we kind of all started together and his career just exploded. It certainly but did. He never, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, and still to this day, but the thing that I loved was he, um, he he said to me, he goes, look, man, if, if you guys can get re-signed and, and, and if there's a way that I can help you ever, let me know. And, and you know, I, I'll, I'll, I was like, really? And he said, yeah. So I really played that card when we signed Interscope because when we signed Interscope, Spike was the hottest director on, in the world. And part of the thing was, is I was like, yeah, you know, he'll do our next video. And they were so like, So you went serious? to the label? Like, you So you went to the label? Well, no, we were already... No, it, we were basically what had happened with us is that we got dropped and every we we had no label except we were on side one dummy and at that point there was the radio station k-rock in la oh yeah and k-rock was the most as you know the most influential music generator there was and what ended up happening to us was uh we ended up k-rock ended up playing the single california and they just picked it up because the uh, our guitar player knew a DJ there or knew someone that knew someone that was a DJ got them the single and they on on their own they were like wow this 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 is a super that like we like this song and they kind of heard about wax but they didn't know that we weren't on a label anymore because it was it kind of happened so quick at the same time um before we were leaving to go on the road um I ran into Scott Wheel and a Stone Temple Pilots. And he was another guy that was just, we both started at the same time. We were friends. Um, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, weren't the band that, that they became 
and and you know scott was one of those kind of guys that like when we started playing shows together they were still mighty joe young they weren't even stone temple pilots right so we started yeah we started hanging out but <clears throat> now I, I run into him after you know we've had our first record out i run into him after we've got dropped and um i you know he's like hey I heard, you know i heard you guys got your own record label and i was like i guess you know he's like hey give me a cd and i gave him a cd no i didn't think anything about it went out on the road and at the time my girlfriend calls me and you know we, we didn't even have phones back then like i check in with her and she's like i've been trying to get a hold of you i've been calling the clubs i'm like what's up and she's like Scott Whelan took over K Rock, you know, this week. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, good for him. She's like, Joe, he played wax like the entire time during his interview. And this morning they're playing California. And I was like, what? And it happened seriously that quick that wow. we went from having nothing going on to everything. And then that's basically what ended up happening was, you know, we had every record label that had passed on us wanting to sign us just because we were on K just because we we're on K Rock. So it's incredible. It's like, whoa, how did that all, you know, Scott Wheeling. one of the things, yeah. One of the things that we had going on was, uh, one of the things we had going on was that Spike was going to do our next video. So that was just another thing that we could put on the table. That's fantastic. You also had, a, yeah. you know, mall rats. That yeah. was pretty big for you guys too. Cause yeah. that movie was yeah, such that a, came together. that came to, yeah, that came together once we were signed because then we were just in the, you know, I think, I think face to face is on mall rats too. Yeah. Yeah. That was a yeah. good soundtrack. Um, 22 jacks. I got to keep this moving because I want to get to your new career, which is really booming. <laughs> uh, 20, 22 jacks seem <clears throat> to have the, the buzz from day one. People started calling it a punk super group, Steve Soto yeah. and you together. Um, before I forget, man, I, I know that you were probably close to Steve and he passed away oh, yeah. a few years ago, man. If you want to say a few words mm -hmm. about him, he was very well loved guy. Gosh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there isn't a day that doesn't go by that like I don't think about Steve, you know. Uh you know, he was just one of those people that he was so positive. I mean, the real thing about Steve is he was just such a talent, man. I mean, the guy you know, people used to say, oh, what's it like being in the band with Steve Soto? You know, adolescence. It was more like I love the adolescence. Adolescence was such a huge influence on my life as, you know, I just love that band. But being in a band with Steve was hard because he was such a good si singer, such a good songwriter. But he always he always pushed me to write more. He always pushed me to write better songs. He always pushed me to show him ideas. Uh and he I took my ideas and he made them better. I mean, all the songs that we wrote together in 22 Jacks, you know, they all started some of them with me just humming, a, humming a lyric or, or humming a, a guitar line or, you know, or trying to get through on a guitar line and then giving it to him and then him, him going, okay, let, you know, like I always felt like I could take an idea, give it to him and he would just make it so much better. Uh, I really loved, I loved touring with him. I mean, he was, he was one of my best friends. Uh, you know, he, the thing I loved about Steve also was for who he was, he never carried himself as a guy that thought he was better than anyone. You know, he, he anyone would approach him that, and he loved talking about music. I, I don't know how many times we'd be hanging out and I would just ask him questions and, and he would just tell you amazing stories, whether it was stories about the germs or whether it was stories about legal weapon or tour stories about the adolescence. So being in a band with him was amazing. And I was really close to his mom and dad. You know, they knew me since I was a little kid. And I knew Steve since I was like, I was, I, I was friends with Steve when I was like 20. So like we had this friendship from the time I was like 20 till, till the very end. But the fact that we got to play in a band together and, and make records together and, and tour together was, was amazing. Yeah, that band did really well too. Um, now you guys yeah. actually you, you've gone through some lineup changes, but the band actually still is still a band technically, right? Oh no, no, we haven't. I mean, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't done anything. I mean, we never. Yeah, I mean, the last we did a run of dates. Uh, I don't even know when we did it, like years and years ago. But yeah, I haven't. Yeah, Twenty Two Jacks hasn't done anything in a long time. I mean, the thing that's cool though is you. You know, like with the the members though, like uh, Jose Medellas, he's doing amazing. He has Revival Drum Shop up in Portland. Right. He's always recording. He's always working with all these super cool eclectic 
musicians and it, it's so him and I, I just love him and I are, you know, we don't talk as much as I wish we did, but I follow him on Instagram and he's always got this cool project he's working on. And I just love Jose. So Jose Dallas, he's doing amazing. And he, you know, he, he was in the breeders so much, you know, so many great, he's played with so many great people. And then obviously Chris Shiflett, Foo Fighters. So, you know, uh, you know, Chris and I still, you know, we still see each other always are trying to get a surf in. Uh, and then Bill Franza, who played guitar, uh, him and I, you know, we're, we've been, he was in Frontline with me. So we've been friends, wow. gosh, since I was probably 17 years old. And then, um, and then who else was in the band? Uh, and then <laughs> Kelly Lemieux, Kelly Lemieux, who's in Buck Cherry. He was the oh, original Buck bass player. Was yeah. there a, was, is there a guy that was in 22 Jacks that became a professional wrestler? God, no. I don't know. I think that's a mistake I read on. Um, there's a link wow. on the 22 Jacks Wikipedia page that takes you to this professional wrestlers page. And I don't know really? why. I don't, yes. Wow. I got to check that out. <laughs> I wish I could remember the guy's name. But if, no, if you. No if, professional wrestlers. If you close the door on music now with your new comedy career that you've had for several years now, or are you going to. Will there ever be? I know Wax did get together for a little while, but that was like fifteen years ago. Yeah. Um, so is it? Is it? Are you done with music? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's funny because people will ask me that, and I just, I gosh, I don't. I just, I haven't really ever had the urge to, um, to sit down and you know. A, a while ago, I did some songs with C.J. Ramone. He. Uh, we did a benefit together and, and that was super fun because CJ played bass in 22 Jackson yeah. tour. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I love, I love Chris. He's an amazing person, such a solid dude. And he was doing a benefit and he's like, Hey, you know, why don't you, um, you know, we'll do some Ramon songs. And, and it was fun because I sang like all these Ramon songs and we did a set together and I loved it, but I, I don't know as far as like writing music and singing and stuff like that. I just, I don't know. I haven't, like when you're a singer in a band, people, you know, they don't ask you to come and jam, you know, like I, maybe if you're a guitar player right. or a drummer, but, but for me, I, I, you know, it, I, I'm not, I'm not saying like if someone didn't say to me, Hey man, we're, we're, you know, would you sing for us that I wouldn't be interested in doing it? But, um, I, you know, you don't get those when you're the singer, you're the vibe of the band. So like if, if you know, no one's calling you up saying, hey, man, we're looking for you to sing. And, you know, every once in a while I'll run into someone and they'll be like, you know, a friend. It's usually like a friend, you know, I, they'll be like, why are you singing anymore? You should be singing. But I don't know. I just never I just I've, I've been so focused on comedy and just just driven by stand up for the last 15 years that. I don't know. Maybe I think it's just really that really fills up that void. If there is a void of wanting to be on stage. I didn't realize it was that long. I was going to ask you about uh, the transition. Cause I know you do radio too, or you used to, I don't know yep, if you do I anymore. Yeah. I mean, was that, was that when you realized that comedy might be an option for you when you started totally. doing the radio? Can you talk Absolutely. about what that was like that transition? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing for me was, when I got, when I got asked, when I started doing radio, it was the first time, like, usually I was the guy being interviewed, you know, I was, I was, I was getting asked the questions. So when the, when the table got turned around and I was interviewing people, I really enjoyed doing that. But then when I was doing radio, I would tell stories on air and it was at a time where radio still, you know, wasn't like pop you in for, you know, front sell, you know, do a front sell, do a back sell, mention this, mention that, and make sure you keep people's attention. You got 20 seconds, you know, the thing that, the thing that was still going on with the station I was on, I was on the station called Indy 1031 in, in LA and, and the program director really encouraged you to, you know, he wanted you to talk about the music. He really wanted you to, you know, so for me, I started kind of telling those stories and doing those things. And what ended up happening was uh, I realized, oh, wow, like people, you know, people liked the stories, people liked, liked what I was talking about. And, um, you know, it kind of drifted into, I don't think at the time when I was doing radio, I was like, oh yeah, man, I want to do stand up, but it definitely turned into like, oh, wow. You know, like people like my stories. And then I'd always toyed with the idea of 
doing kind of like a, a one man show. And that was really how I got into stand up. I wrote this one man show called California Calling. Yeah. And I did that in LA for a while. And I did that around the States. And it was a sh show with photographs and stories. And it was funny. And then there was other parts that weren't funny. And it, it really worked together. But I ended up doing it at the improv in LA and Hollywood. And the woman there was, she was like, you got to do your show here. I did it. It did well. And then she said, if you ever want to come back and you know, do you stand up? I'd love to have you. And I, I was like, wow, I, I think, aren't I doing stand up? She's like, no, you know, you got to come back and be funny in like seven minutes or you got to be funny in 10. And I was like, whoa, how can you even do something in 10 minutes? And that really began the, 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 the journey of me wanting to start doing stand up. When you, st when you started doing those shows, what were the first few live shows like for you? Were you nervous? I mean, did you were you comfortable? I mean, how did that work? I mean, out? I, I was definitely. I mean, the thing was, you know, you're always nervous. You know, you're always like, oh well, you know, like I wonder how this will work. But um, I was fortunate. In this, you know, by being in a band for as many years as I was, and being on stage, and I think being someone that you know played music and and you know playing music and punk rock, you know, it's a very hostile audience. So it's like yeah. I was I I you know, I wasn't afraid of being in front of the audience at a comedy club because I was used to being afraid. I was used to being in front of an audience that was like a group of skinheads or a group of people that, you know, definitely didn't like your band. And they, you know, they vocalized, they didn't like your band. So I knew that wouldn't happen in stand up. And um, I was also lucky that my, with my stand up too, like I, 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 I knew how to get laughs. They weren't probably the best laughs, but I never, I never went out there and bombed so bad that, that it was terrible and that I couldn't pull it off. And that's only because I was used to being on stage and I knew how to kind of read the audience. And, but my material was terrible, but at least I knew how to go up there and do it so that I could get by. So those early shows, I would say, you know, they weren't like, oh, my God, you're breaking new comedy terrain. But it was definitely like, OK, yeah, you know, I, you know, it was cool, you know, but I was really into it and I really wanted to get good at it. Were, were there any comedians that like admired that you admired that influenced your approach or did you just come oh, yeah. from your own place? <clears throat> no, no. For me, like I would say, like, you know, like I love Greg Gerardo. That was like that was a huge comic. That was a comic that like I just loved. You know, that was someone that I really, really just, yeah, like, I loved his approach. I loved the way, he, I just loved everything about him. And then, um, but then, you know, as a kid growing up, I grew up with the Richard Pryors, the, you know, the uh, George Carlins, uh, Robin Williams, Steve Martin. So I had the foundation of watching and listening to great comedians. My Because my dad used to turn me on to a lot of comedy. And, you know, I was a kid of Saturday Night Live and all of that. So, like, I was really able to see and hear all of that but but at the time going in to do stand up from from the world i was in coming from music i definitely was on my own you know there wasn't like there was like i i would almost say people that knew i was a guy from the music world coming into the comedy world i wouldn't say that i was welcomed with you know like everyone was stoked i was there like I was coming from a band perspective, like, hey, you know, and comics are very, you know, comics, comedians are, you know, they're in their head, they're getting ready to go on stage, they're, they're writing material, they're, it's not really the kind of place where, you, you know, you, you find your friends, but it, with, with music, it might be a little bit more open. Comics are very in their head. It's an individual game, whereas a band is a, it's a team sport. So comedians, it's individual. I'm more of a fan of the team sport. I'm more of a fan of hanging out. I'm more of a fan of, you know, more people like, okay, let's, let's all be on the show together where I didn't really know in the beginning when I started doing stand up, it was definitely an individual sport. Now, not saying that people weren't cool to me because they were, but you definitely are on your own. You got to figure that out on your own. I was going to ask you about the similarities about touring as a comedian compared to punk bands. And then I remembered that you actually did a tour with Lars from Rancid where you opened yeah. for him and he did like, so was he, was that an acoustic tour for him that he was doing that? No, no, he, he, no, he fired up the Marshall. He did, he brought the, the whole thing. So what was that like for you? Well, what, you know, it's great. What see the thing was, is that when I first started, uh, doing stand up there was a lot of musicians that were like 
that th there were a lot of musicians that wanted me to go on the road with them. And, you know, Jesse Mallon, I did, did shows with him. Yeah. Um, uh, Brian Fallon from Gaslight Anthem. But when I started 15 years ago, comedy and music had it. They, I mean, over the years, historically, you know, you have Sam Kennison and Motley Crue, like, you know, you have the, you have the crossover, but, you know, and even with Jim Brewer, you have the crossover, you know, Jim's done all the stuff with Metallica, but the thing that, the thing that really like comedy wasn't as accepted, I think with the music crowd. And then what, what ended up happening over the last 15 years is you got, you got, you, know, you got like guys like Ryan Adams bringing out comedians, you've got bands bringing out different comedians. And what I think's happened because of the boom of comedy was, and at least I experienced it on that last tour with Lars was Lars brought me out and it was just me and him there was no band before me and the place would be packed and the largest people made it clear to everyone hey there's a comedian before we go on before me, Lars so like and what ended up happening was I think the years and years and years of me touring and putting out material the people that were coming to see Lars were from my background so they were like oh yeah I've either seen Joseph here or there or I've I've wanted to see him like, you know, like, OK, this is cool. And then what what we got from that tour was the the crowds were really into it because they were like, it's my comedy was able to touch on the community that we've all grown up, grown up in. So I was able to really like dial in what I was doing and and also just my stand up in general tied into like their lifestyle because there's a lot of parents there. There was a lot of, you know, people that were married and there are a lot of people that, you know, had kids and teenagers and things like that. So all of it really dialed in and what ended up happening where people were like, man, we love this. It's so much better than an opening band. We want to see Lars. We want to see him do his thing, but we don't want to sit through a band that we don't know. So 40 minutes of you is fine. You know, like it worked really, really, really well. Did you see, did you see a lot of people that <clears throat> were fans of your previous bands in the crowd i mean did they come and see you or was it more um, of a rancid kind of crowd yeah, you know what i'll be honest i'll be honest um what i've noticed is it's it's definitely i'll i mean i i it's rare that people know my background in music really and now more than oh absolutely now more than ever everyone either they know me from my stand-up so like i'll I'll be out and about and people will be like, oh, well, we saw you with Jim Brewer. Oh, well, we saw you with so-and-so. Hey, we came to see you headline here. Um, you know, they don't know. Every once in a while, though, I can tell someone, you know, they're like looking at me and they're like, wait a minute, I know this guy from somewhere. And then after the show, they're like, hey, were you the singer of, you know, Wax? Wait, were you the <laughs> singer of 22 Jacks? You know, which it makes sense because, you know, Wax and 22 Jacks, that, that was, you know, a, lo a long time ago and if you go to see me do stand-up like you know this week when i'm in naples you're not gonna you know I'm, I'm not up there you know i don't make any references to it or anything so it's 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 not something that 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 would be out there like you would definitely have to be someone that either saw me back in the day or you know knew the history but yeah right. i really don't even i just and i don't it's not that i don't I'm not that I don't talk about it because I'm not into it. It's just, it just doesn't fit into the comedy world. You know, it's a if new someone life. Asks me about it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a new life. But you know, uh, even when I headline a show, I used to talk about it more when I would headline. But it it just doesn't. I don't know. It's like it's hard to explain and do comedy based in that world unless the audience is from it. Now, like when I go out to Vegas and do punk rock bowling, oh my God, I can lean on it all night and everyone, everyone there knows, oh yeah, this guy's that this is like the punk rock comedian guy. Uh, so those opportunities are super fun. When I was opening for Lars, definitely people were like, oh yeah, we heard he was in a band. We did. So that worked really well. But if you're at the Denver Comedy Works on a Friday night and you're there in, to see me, chances are you, you're not going to know that, that I was in a band. I think it's fantastic you've been able to reinvent yourself like this. It really is. So it's, before it's I, weird. Yeah, before I let you go, man, why don't you tell us about your future plans? I mean, I know you put, I know of, of at least one comedy album that you put out. Was there more than one? Yep. or is, So do you, do you plan on doing more, more of that or are you going to be a touring comedian? 
yeah, I mean, right now, uh, I uh, I released that one record on 800 Pound Gorilla, and then they're gonna put out a video. Uh, this I released this e I released like this mini special, uh, in um in November of last year, and that's like a 25 minute set of mine, just to you know let people see what I'm up to and check out my set, and then okay, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Sorry, bless <about> you. <laughs> um, you can edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably <or> not, not. <laughs> you know um i was gonna say and then so then right now this year i've been i'm gonna be recording a new special i hate using that word special it sounds so pretentious i'm gonna be recording a new live recording a new live release at the end of the year of uh, this year to put out next year and i'm writing a ton right now and i'm not i mean i'm on the road constantly so i mean that's 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 basically where i'm at right now on the road constantly um i feature for jim which is amazing so we got a ton of tour dates through the rest of the year and uh and that's i'm just uh i'm just kind of you know i released that 800 pound gorilla thing a while ago and then i'm writing this i have this new piece out and i'm writing the new piece so i'm in i'm in a place where it's a lot of touring and it's a lot of writing and it's a lot of performing and I, I love it. I love being on the road. Hey, you know, thanks a lot for letting me go through your whole career with you. you know, I Dude, mean, I know thank you for doing it. I hope yeah. I hope I did okay. I hope you did I, great. I was all right. You did great, you man. Know? Good luck to you, man, out there. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me and for reaching out. And thank you for letting me know that one of our former members of 22 Jacks is a, is a wrestler now. I didn't know that. I got to I'm going to send I'm going to go guys... on Wikipedia and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's there. I'm going to check it out for sure. Thank you He's... so much, brother. Take care, Joe. I'll see you soon. All Thank right. you, bro. Late.